With the dawn of man began the age of the anthropocentric extinctions. We humans, for all of our intelligence, and despite that our powerful minds can fathom the mysteries of the universe, we have an uncanny ability for disrupting the vital ecosystems of our own world. And here, in the 21st century, we can see the evidence of this disruption over the nighttime Earth, the lights of innumerable great cities, each a testament to our ability to build, but also to pollute. For each creates voluminous amounts of pollution in the form of carbon and other chemicals, which travel into the atmosphere and affect the health and well-being of all life. Now, at the dawn of the 21st century, we are so widespread, our city so entirely ubiquitous, that it is only in a few remaining rare and remote wild places where the air can still be said to be pure, though even that is but a relative measure. For even in the farthest, most remote regions of the Antarctic, or these skies high above the British Columbian Rocky Mountains, an analysis of the air will reveal the presence of dozens if not hundreds of industrial man-made chemicals, though in smaller amounts. Some of these the natural world can weather, but there are other organisms, canaries in the coal mine so to speak, which are especially sensitive. One such, under normal circumstances, is especially ubiquitous. This family of organisms are the lichens, and they are nature's telltales of the atmosphere and portents that tell us when things have gone wrong. The lichen portrayed here is Osnea turcodia, often simply called Osnea, or old man's beard. A pendant lichen found hanging from many trees in eastern Canada and south as far as Texas and Florida. Like all the lichens of the Osnea genus, it is extremely sensitive to air pollution. The algae and cyanobacteria that live within the protective fungal structures of lichens can be easily harmed by accumulations of sulfur, and sulfur dioxide air pollution is a common byproduct of industrial activities. All of these pendulous, beard-like Usnea lichens are especially sensitive to air pollution. When they are present in a forest, it is an indicator that the air is good, and the rains are not also saturated with sulfur dioxide, which causes the phenomenon known as acid rain. But as one approaches cities and industrialized areas, one begins to see a phenomenon known as zonation. As one draws closer to the city, certain kinds of lichens will disappear, and getting closer still leads to the disappearance of other kinds of lichens, revealing zones of increasing air pollution. These conifer woods close to a city are absent most kinds of lichens. All that we see upon the twigs of these conifers is a bit of crustose lichen here, and here, and here. As one approaches the pollution of industrialized and urban zones, lichens begin to vanish according to their structure. Going from the phenotypes that are the least tolerant of pollution, the fruticose lichens, to those that are moderately tolerant of pollution, the foliose lichens, and leading to those which are least sensitive to pollution, the crustose lichens. Fruticose lichens are those which have bushy or shrubby coral-like structures, of which the Osnea genus is a fine example. They make up the first zone to vanish in the presence of pollution. A foliose lichen is one which has a thallus or body that resembles a plant structure, such as pulmonaria, which often appears as leaves attached to the side of a tree trunk. They define the next zone to vanish in the presence of pollution. Crustose lichens might be thought of as crusty lichens. They appear as crusts on the surfaces of stones and trees, sometimes so thin they seem to have been painted on. While many represent the final zone to be destroyed by air pollution, some can persist right into cities. Thus, the relative air pollution, particularly sulfur dioxide, can be discerned by a zone with all types of lichens, a zone lacking fruticose lichens, and a zone lacking fruticose and foliose lichens. The more lichen types lacking, the closer one is to the source of the air pollution. There is no question regarding the importance of air quality. One way or another, every living thing on this planet, including us, is profoundly affected by it. It affects insects, plants, fungi, the microscopic world, the very things that are the foundation of life. It is so important that over the centuries, many people have relocated, even if that meant profoundly changing their lifestyles for the privilege of breathing pure air. But due to the strange machinations of this modern world, it is ever harder to find.
Pure air, being recognized increasingly as a precious resource, has become the subject of study, warranting expensive tools such as weather balloons. Small, high-altitude rockets intended to carry instrumentation packages and gather samples, and which provide information on the regions and altitudes where pollution can be found. And throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, many satellites have been launched specifically to study the concentrations and kinds of pollutants to be found in the air. But the problem with all these methods of study is they are expensive and inaccessible to most. Lichens are not, however. If one knows the three basic lichen forms, anyone can take a walk about their landscape and get a rough sense of the air quality. The presence of folios lichens are a good sign, but an abundance of fruticose lichens is a solid indicator that the air in those parts is very good. And the more fruticose species, the better. But what is it about lichens that gives them such a need for pure air? and by way of that, makes them such good indicators of air pollution. To answer this question, we must take a closer look at the structure of lichens, as well as examine how they live. The lichen here is a species of Lobaria, a foliose lichen that resembles leaves sprouting out of tree bark. And this is a sliver of that same species of lichen, magnified at 30 power. It is an epiphyte, which is to say it grows upon the surface of a plant. And it is not one, but at least three organisms, an ascomycete fungus, green algae, and cyanobacteria that have come together to become a composite of three kingdoms living in such close unison that they would appear to be a single organism. This is the top side of the pulmonaria's leaf-like thallus. At the top, just under a thin skin of fungi, one can see the layer of green where the algae receives sunlight and perform photosynthesis, providing food for the various organisms that make up this lichen. Below and to the right, at the lip of the thallus, one can see the red and white hues of the fungal structure. Here and there, the fungal structure also shows through at the surface. Here, I have cut away a thin strip of the thallus, about half a millimeter wide, and placed it on its side. Now one can see the layers of the lichen. The majority of the fungal structure is underneath, and a thin farm of food-producing algae is placed at the top to catch the sunlight. But we also see here something very significant, something which makes lichens meaningfully different from plants. The lichen has no waxy outer cuticle, nor epidermis, that is, an outer layer to insulate its delicate inner components. Lichens derive their nutrients literally from the air, taking what they need from the dust that abounds. They have no roots, even if they grow on the ground, merely a root-like structure to hold them in place, called a rising. But risings, though they may look like roots, don't absorb any nutrients from the ground. Many lichens, except those that dissolve stone, obtain all their nutrients from dust in the air. And it is their lack of waxy cuticle and skin-like epidermis that allows them to be effective enough at gathering dust to survive on such meager fare. And in the world prior to man, before industrial pollutants, this was an extremely successful strategy, allowing lichens to come to colonize between 6 and 8 percent of Earth's surface. But what in nature might have predicted the advent of man? and the vast polluting machinery that seems to define our existence. So lichens find the very structure that made them so successful now vulnerable to pollution. They cannot resist the abundance of sulfur dioxide that our machines make. That sulfur dioxide enters their chlorophyll-containing organisms and degrades the chlorophyll into phytophyton, causing the organisms to lose photosynthetic efficiency. The end result is lichens, Organisms which in nature can live for thousands of years on little more than dust and water vapor find themselves starving to death. Leaves also serve to shield plants from pollution and the unwanted sulfur dioxide and acid rain by serving in roles something like umbrellas. But lichens do not have such structures. Even the leaf-like growths of the Libaria pulmonaria shown in this photo are not true leaves. These structures are designed to gather what dust and water come to them leaving lichens largely unshielded and unable to deal with impure environments. Lichens are also vulnerable because they are extremely long-lived, some able to live thousands of years. Across decades, centuries, and millennia, they accumulate much in the way of impurities. And with enough time, even tough, slow-growing crustos lichens like those shown in this image will inevitably succumb to concentrations of pollution. As to the question of why is it that some lichen forms are more susceptible to air pollution than others, the answer is simple. Fruticose lichens, with their branching coral-like structures, present the most surface to the air. Foliose lichens, with their flatter structures, present the second most surface to the air. And crustose lichens, flat on the substrates upon which they grow, present little surface to the air. Thus, fruticose lichens can absorb the most sulfur dioxide, 
foliose lichens a moderate amount, and crestose lichens, presenting the lowest amount of surface area, are the slowest absorbers. Lichens are such a successful form of life that they have re-evolved around the planet multiple times, over a span of hundreds of millions of years. And it is telling, when it comes to modern human civilization, that our activities are driving them extinct in many places of the Earth. And their lack is especially evident in heavily industrialized areas, such as the North American East and West Coasts, and much of Europe, from the continent to the UK. Indeed, in many places around the UK, foliose lichens are entirely lacking. Lichens are canaries in the coal mine, and they tell us quite clearly that we're doing something wrong. When I walk in the pristine forests of remote regions where the air is pure, great epiphytic lichens cover the trunks of trees and hang from their branches. But here, in this urban park, one sees so little, and their absence is very much a result of air pollution. If we can wipe out these organisms, such amazing survivors, which occupied this planet hundreds of millions of years before us, it is a powerful indicator that the way our civilization goes about industry and business must change. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.